Hello everyone and welcome back to Carlos Reads the Bible. It's been a while, but I did not forget about you and I did not forget about continuing this, which will be a thing that will go for a long time. Who knows? I already have plans on what I'm going to read after Genesis, but we still have a, a few chapters <laughs> to go through. We're still in chapter six and today's chapter is going to be fun. It's always fun. What, what am I saying? It's always good stuff that we're going to read here. And just a reminder, I'm reading from the ESV, English Standard Version. And the copyright information is at the end of this of this uh, thingy. But anyway, what I suggest and what I said before is that two things. One, if you're new, watch the introduction. Because in the introduction, I talk about my approach to reading the Bible and why I'm reading the Bible and things like some assumptions you could could call them. And the second thing is, I'm reading Genesis chapter 6. It's very useful if you go and read chapter 6 first by yourself and then we go through this because I'm not going to read chapter 6, the whole chapter, and then talk about some individual parts. I'm going to read some parts and then I will stop when I feel like stopping and then I'm going to talk about stuff. So let's begin. Genesis chapter 6. Remember, from chapter 5, there's the genealogy from Adam to Noah. We mentioned a bit of Enoch and whatnot. So now we're here on the chapter where it starts talking about Noah building the ark. Yep. Chapter 6, verse 1. When, when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them. Verse 2. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive. And they took as their wives any they chose. Verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Okay, <laughs> this first four verses here in the beginning, uh, it's quite interesting here because it's talking about, first, the sons of God, and it's talking about daughters of men, and it's talking about the Nephilim. And it, there's some interesting things going on here. Now, Louise and I, in our podcast called Don't Listen to This Podcast... And even though the title of the podcast is Don't Listen to This Podcast, I encourage you to listen to the podcast because it's a good podcast. We discuss stuff from the Bible. The reason why it's called Don't Listen to This Podcast is because after you listen, you have no excuse <laughs> for the things we talk about. It's kind of a joke, all right, if you if you don't get it. but And also, we talk about controversial things. Maybe. I don't think they are, but, you know, some people think they are. So, in, in, and we had an episode, I think it's the last episode, because we haven't recorded a podcast in such a long time, and we're going to do a new one soon, hopefully in a couple of days, finally, and we're going to debunk completely and utterly uh, crazy theology. Uh, what is it called? Gosh, I even forgot the name. The Liberation Theology, which is a, an abomination. But anyway, here. Anyway, that podcast, we actually spent a whole podcast talking about this. All right, but I'm just going to go and talk a little bit about this for a moment. The sons of God, what could that be? Every time in the Old Testament, when he mentions the sons of God, the Bible talks about angels, okay? There are three options here for what the sons of God are. Option number one, it is a uh, uh, generation of Seth. Remember how there was... Cain and Cain was bad and whatever, and there was a generation of Seth. The sons of God could be the generation of Seth, and the sons of that generation then saw they they started marrying people from other groups of people who were not godly. Allegedly, there's, there's not much information here. Uh, of uh, we just know that the generation of Seth was probably more godly than the generation of Cain. The second option is the sons of God are angels, right? The third option, what was the third option? Gosh. Third option is irrelevant because it's 
not not likely. I mean, three of them can be can be justified by the by literature by the scriptures. You can actually kind of justify them. You can't say for sure which one it is. Now, Enoch. There's a book called the Book of Enoch. It's an epi. What is it called? Pseudopigraphal book because even though it's called the Book of Enoch, it was probably not written by him, and it's not in the Bible because it's not very reliable. <laughs> There, it's not part of the canon of the Bible. It's not part of the, the Jewish canon of the Bible. It's not part of the Christian canon of the Bible, except for two churches. I think there's a couple of churches that have that book. And we don't even have the original manuscript. Or it, There are different pieces and fragments, but through the Book of Enoch, it was like parts of it were written. It, it was clearly written by different people. At the time of Jesus, however, and at the time of the uh, apostles, it's likely that that book was well known because it's mentioned in the New Testament. Some stories about it, like they give the impression that the sons of God that we're talking about here are angels. But he mentions it in a way that is like, forget about these angels. Because peop- there was, there were a lot of tradition about, not tradition, the book of Enoch talks about angels, the fallen angels. And there's like genealogies of angels. And there was this belief that, oh, this angel is better than that angel, and this angel is better than that angel, and da 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 And there was all these arguments and discussions. And uh, I think Paul, uh, I think in Book of Peter as well, there's in Jude potentially, there's a few places in the New Testament where it mentions, forget about those genealogies of angels, that don't worry about them. No. <laughs> And again, we talk. Luis and I we talk about this in a much more extensive situation. Um, now, if if it is the sons of God, if the sons of God are angels, then you come to the conclusion that the angels saw the daughters of men and and were attractive, and then they had wives and they had children with these daughters of men, and things happen. Now, what is this Nephilim situation that is going on here? Were the sons of God the Nephilim? Well. Not really, and this is why, okay? This is why. You need to understand that the, this book, the, Gen- the, the, the Bible, was written primarily for an audience. And the audience who primarily got this book, they knew exactly where the Nephilim were. And in verse 4, that's a parenthesis. It's not a continuation of the story. It's just saying, by the way, and that can be implied, that's implied and assumed because that sentence specifically doesn't start with end. And almost every sentence in the Bible, or at least in, in the narrative format like that, it starts with end. End da 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 da, end da 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 da, end da 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 da. But that one doesn't, which is probably a parenthesis. And it's basically saying, you know, the sons of God did this. And by the way, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, which is basically saying, we're not talking about the Nephilim here. We're talking about something else. All right? And it's saying, these were the mighty men who were, were of old, the men of renown. So the Nephilim were kind of like mythological, not mythological, but they were like heroes and strong, mighty gibor, strong people at the time. Like there was maybe legends and stuff. But because it's a parenthesis here, we know that it's not talking about the Nephilim. It's talking about the sons of God, which are probably angels. That's what I think. And even if you ignore the book of Enoch completely, because who knows what in the book of Enoch is accurate and what's not, because it could be. But the thing is, because the, it's just pieced together of like different writers, it's hard to know exactly what's going on there. But in the book of Enoch, it talks about angels mating with humans. And then there was like this crazy creatures. And he talks about the angel of the sun and the angel of the moon and the angel of the earth and the angel of the ocean and whatever, which is kind of very, very similar to Egypt, Egyptian mythology. So there's a, you could go and you could go and talk about it and think that, oh, maybe those children of the angels were those gods that the Egyptians worshipped and talked about and there was like stories about them but in the book of Enoch it also says that those those children of angels were huge like 30 meters high like huge giants or something like that so uh, who knows but let's hold that thought 
maybe they were angels, okay? And they were they were bad. And they, we know they were bad because of the because of the following. Verse 5. The Lord saw that the weakness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, men and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. We know that this was the flood that God sent and killed everybody. And we know that he didn't send another flood after that. And looking around today, I still see <laughs> that the weakness, wickedness of man is great in the earth. And that every intention of the thoughts of our hearts are evil continually. I mean, look around. Right? Why didn't God kill everybody? Why doesn't he just come and kill everybody? He's very patient. God is very patient with our sin and our wickedness. But you could argue that at that time, <laughs> that time, it was a little bit worse because there were angels and children of angels, fallen angels, roaming around, doing pretty evil things, eating each other and whatnot. Now, a lot of what I'm saying, it's kind of based on what the book of Enoch says. So, we don't know for sure. All we know is that there was a lot of weakness in the earth and that God decided to cure everybody, except for Noah. Now, here's an interesting thing that I want to talk about. Because here it says, the Lord regretted. And then he says that he was grieved. He grieved him to his heart. And then he says that uh, the Lord regretted that he made um, and he grieved him to his heart. I will blot out men, da, 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 and I am sorry that I have made them. Now, obviously, God, God's character. God is not a human. God doesn't have passions. Okay, if you think about us, we change continually. All right, we grew up, when I was a kid, I wanted to do this, I wanted to do that. Now I'm doing other things. Sometimes I'm happy. Sometimes I'm sad. Okay? Sometimes I'm hungry. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm wide awake. Sometimes I'm excited about things. And it's the same to you. Sometimes you're sad, you're depressed, you're, you're happy, you're angry, you, are, you feel love. Sometimes you don't. God is not like that. God is not a human. God doesn't change his mind. And you can get that from the entirety of the Bible. That's all his character. You read the Bible and you understand that that's God's character. God's not a human. God doesn't have passions. God is, he, he is what he is. It's in his name. When he revealed himself to Moses, he said, I am. That's my name. I am. And that reveals a lot about his character because it means that he was not created. That he just, he is. He just is. He exists. You know, the Bible describes Jesus as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, which means that Jesus also is. He wasn't created. Jesus wasn't created by God. Jesus is God. God, the Father, God, the Son, the God, the Holy Spirit is God. And He is. In three different manifestations or whatever word you want to call, they're not people. They don't feel like us. That's why when people say God is love, yeah, that is true. <laughs> that is true. God is love. He doesn't change. That's part of his character. Yeah? God is also wrath. And God is also judge, judgment and justice. That's all... It, it just is. It doesn't change. God is not sometimes love and then sometimes wrath and sometimes justice and sometimes truth. God is all of it. All the time. Right? And another point about God is love, but I'm probably going to talk about this with Louise in our podcast because we want to actually talk about this for a long time and really dig, dig deep on this. Is that we humans, and that's very good by CS, very good book by C.S. Lewis that kind of touches a little bit about this. Love is, is such a terrible word to translate agape 
which is the love of God in Greek. There's four words for love in Greek. One of them is agape, which is God's love, which is different than filio, it's different than eros, and it's different than another one that is not, I don't think even appears in the Bible. We try to understand God's love by putting our love into, whenever we see God's love and God loves, we try to put the way we express love and, and experience love into God. That's not what God is. That's not what the love of God is like. Okay, there's a, there's a, an entire chapter in First Corinthians that kind of gives a little bit of a like, love is this, love is that. And by the way, the word in there is agape. It's not filio, it's not eros, it's not the other one that I forgot. But it's not what we think love is. That's not what God is love means. Just a parenthesis there. Okay, but we still need to under, understand and kind of make sense of this because it says here, the Lord regretted you know, if God is love and his wrath and his justice, all at the same time, how can he regret? How can he be sorry? How can he, how can he change his mind? Did, was God surprised? Didn't God know that this was going to happen? I mean, he's sovereign. He's outside of time. He transcends time. Didn't he know that this was going to happen? Right? Now, of course. If you just read this passage here by itself, you might conclude that, well, God changed his mind. He regretted, blah, blah, blah. He, he didn't know. He's shocked. He's surprised. But if you take this into context with the Bible, you know that this is just a depiction of the events from a human perspective. Because, of course, God doesn't regret anything. He doesn't change his mind. And as I said, his love is also wrath. And to the people who disobey him, all they get is his wrath and not his love. And the people who obey him, they get his, his love. You know, people think that God's love is unconditional. Mm. God loved everyone unconditionally by sending Jesus to die on the cross. But if you reject his, if you reject his display of love for you, a display of love that is to the point of sending his own eternally begotten son, who, by the way, is also God, to die on the cross. If you're aware of that, of that expression of love, and you choose to reject it, don't be misled. You're not going to experience God's love. <laughs> you're going to experience God's wrath on your life, in the future, even in the present. God is patient. He's very patient. But there's always a time when his judgment comes. And it's exactly what happened here. Another judgment like this one is the one that happened to Lot. Well, not really to Lot, because Lot was saved, just like Noah was saved from this. But what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, where God came and destroyed the city, right? Not even Lot's wife got, it was spared. She looked back and she turned into a, into a pillar of salt. That sounds a little bit like an overreaction, maybe. Not really. No, 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 no. But anyway, so here we know that God is determined to destroy everything and start again. Because there was a lot of wickedness on the earth. Now, I look on the, again, as I said, I look on the earth now and I think, wow. I think it's time for God to come and destroy everything and start again. And it will happen. The day will come when Jesus comes back and that will actually happen. And then you'll be like that forever. It's not going to have to start again and again. But God's patient. Not the time. Not yet. Verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Verse 10. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Here's an interesting thing here again. Of all the people on the earth, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It says here that he was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. There's just so much to unpack here. I could actually spend so much time talking about this. And we're only in verse 9. But I don't want to go for too long because I, I don't want this episode. I want it to be like kind of an overview and maybe I can go deep 
on some of these things in the more appropriate form. But here's the thing. Noah didn't have the law. Here's the thing to think about, okay? I'm not going to have the answer to this, and I'm not going to answer this question. But just some things to think about. Because Noah was a righteous man. How are we righteous? We're righteous because of Jesus. These people, they didn't have Jesus. Abraham didn't have Jesus, right? Later on in the Bible, it says that he was, uh, his, he, his faith was counted to him as righteousness. He was made righteous because he believed in God. And it's the same thing here with Noah. Noah walked with God, just like Enoch walked with God. I mean, I don't know if it's just like in the same way, but it's descri- Noah is being described here in the same terms that Enoch was described earlier in, ch- in chapter 5. So in that generation, Noah was a righteous man and probably the most righteous of them all because God chose him. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. How did he know what was right and what was wrong, what was not? Well, we all kind of have a conscience, don't we? Even if you go to Romans later when he talks about a little bit about Abraham and righteousness and sin. He talks that it says that the law, even people without the law, can be can be condemned. Because we have a conscience that condemns us. Right? Now. How is he righteous without Jesus? Good question. Now, if these people, <laughs> without Jesus, they they somehow became righteous. We we are so privileged. We have the whole information. We have the entire revelation of the of God and His righteousness and His salvation. And if we reject it, even though we have the entire revelation. Woe to the people who reject Jesus. So I'm saying, so I'm saying, verse 11. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 12. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. It's a lot of repetition here. I think it's just for us to understand that the, it was really corrupt. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of God for wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Verse 15. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. That is about 137 meters by 26 by 14 meters. And it's pretty standard, like naval dimensions like it kind of looks like a boat Uh, verse 16 make a roof for the ark and finish to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side make it with lower second and third decks 17 for behold i will bring a flood of, of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven everything that is on the earth shall die verse 18 but I will establish my covenant with, covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Verse 19. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Verse 20. Of, t- of the birds according to their kinds, and the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you, to keep them alive. Verse 21. Also take with you, every sort of food that is eaten and stored it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Verse 22. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. He believed. Right? Just like Abraham believed. And he was credited to him as righteousness. Just like it was done with Abraham. Now here's the thing. Here we are today in our comfortable houses where we turn the switch and we have a literacy where we have boats everywhere and airplanes things flying and even today we think about this and we think this is crazy <laughs> this how on earth were you going to put all the animals in this boat and look after them okay and keep them alive for ever so much time which we're going to see later how long it was. And this never happened before. It's never been done before. (laughs) 
I don't know. If I were Noah, I would have lots of questions. But he believed God. And he did exactly as he was told. And now we have some options here. And there are people who are scientists and they try to make sense of this through science. And this is how it was done. And this is how it happened. And whatever and whatnot. And there are people who try to be like, well, this is not really a... A description of how it happened this is poetry or this is this and this is fiction and this is that this is just a story God is trying to make a point and this and that don't be like that be like Noah that listened to the word of God and believed it yeah I'm not reading the Bible to take it apart I want to take it apart because I want to know it I want to learn it because I want to obey it and believe it. I understand there's so many things that might not make a lot of sense to my mind. I wasn't there. You weren't there. We want to be in control of everything. We want to understand everything. And then we were like, oh, wow, but there's so many flood stories. And yes, this is not the only flood story <laughs> that was recorded. There's lots of other civilizations that have flood stories. And it's interesting because most, of the, for example, in ancient Mesopotamia, it's about Potemia. There were other similar flood stories, except that in those stories, their God, they were trying to, um, they were like annoyed with people. They're like, oh, they were, they were annoyed. They were trying to uh, uh, quiet annoying people. Or they were trying to control overpopulation. That was basically the two reasons why their gods decided to flood the earth, which is not the story of this, of the Bible, of the God, I am, this God, the God of the Bible, the real tr one and true God. God had a different motivation and it's all part of his character. You can see that this is incompatible. It's too evil. It's the same thing with the, ba the Tower of Babel that we're going to, we're going to read later. You know, Whoa, men came and they were becoming really, really powerful and God confused them and spread them and separated them and said, no, 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 you're not going to do this. Stop with this. And confused them and gave them different languages. God is in control of everything because he has a plan, right? And even the story is kind of a, even though it's real and it happened, it's also an image of what is to come as well, of salvation, Right? like a lot of things in the Old Testament. By the way, they all point to Jesus at some point. But if we, but we need to make sense of this without Jesus as well, because God is not confusing the people who he gave this book to, the, the first audience of this book. But I think that's all I want to say. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. There's one thing we can learn, is to obey God, to do all that God commanded him. Not question, even when it sounds crazy. I don't know, this is crazy. Let's build a boat and put all the animals in it. They're going to come to you and you just put them on the boat. What? Amazing. Anyway, thanks so much for listening. Uh, I can't wait to see you again next time in uh, two years. I'm joking. I don't know. I'll try to do it, I'll try to do it earlier with uh, Genesis chapter 7 while we continue the flood saga. And it's going to start to get uh, more story telling like Genesis becomes more of like stories and, and things going on. The first few chapters are very, I don't know, creation is such an important theological concept and story. And I just, yeah. One day I will know even more. Maybe we can talk about this for many, many hours. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to be listening to me by then. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. And uh, don't forget to go and also if you listen to this as a podcast, there's, there's also a video on YouTube, on IGTV, on my Instagram, NerdFelice. But if you're watching this on, on Instagram, on IGTV, and you're annoyed because you can't speed up the video to like one and a half or two times, well, go and listen as a podcast or go to YouTube, to my channel on YouTube, and you can also listen there. Watch there two times the speed. A 30-minute video, you can watch it in 15 minutes. Whew. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> All right, that's it for me today. See you next time with Genesis chapter 7. And don't forget 
to go to, don't listen to this podcast and listen to the episode that Luis and I did on Genesis chapter six. I think it's called something about mermaids or something because we started uh, hypothesizing what happened to the angels that had children and did they become mermaids or something like that. I don't remember, it was a long time ago. All right, bye. Carlos Reads the Bible is produced, recorded, edited, and mastered by Carlos Dionisio. Unless otherwise indicated, all scripture quotations are from the ESV Bible, the Holy Bible, English Standard Version, copyright 2001 by Crossway, a publishing ministry of good news publishers, used by permission, all rights reserved. Carlos Reads the Bible is a non-conforming production, copyright non-conforming 2020.